একটু জাস্ট এস এম ম্যাডামকে একটা জাস্ট একটা ইয়ে ইয়ে দিয়ে দেওয়া উনি একটু পরেও দশ মিনিট পরেও জয়েন করতে পারেন একটু কেউ আছো এখানে মৌমিতা বা নবনীতা হ্যালো বিকজ আই ডোন্ট হ্যাভ আর পার্সোনাল নাম্বার মৌমিতা কিংবা নবনীতা আছো এখানে Okay, principal ma'am is he is here. I'm sorry, I'm stuttering because uh, I'm echoing actually. Uh, since since I'm logged in through two devices, I'm extremely sorry for this stutter. Kitu jano, ame kintu kicho bostha pachi na shubida. It is ka ame face korchi because I am logged in through simultaneous two accounts. and it's extremely echoing into my ear but anyway our principal ma'am ma is here sorry sorry again sorry again
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I, Zakia Kalam, on behalf of the Department of English, welcome you all heartily to the very first session of our CBCS 
curriculum based web lecture series ei ar kotha bolte parbo na shuru hoye geche madam in association kore join korte hai iqac chakra college ese madam ke join korte bolte bolo seminar rather webinar i should say has been organized primarily for our students as it has turned out they have been the worst stakeholders in the entire educational system because of the pandemic and its resultant lockdown we all know that they have lost a holistic way of learning through their presence at the college premises if i could borrow from the contemporary terminology they no longer can come in contact with their teachers or this or the fellow friends so our online classes can never be a replacement for the real ones but still it's a meager attempt from our department to organize a space to organize an opportunity where they can interact with the dignitaries our resource persons and others too in this context i both welcome and thank our honorable principal dr shagota dash mohan to ma'am because she has always been such a strong pillar of support for us she has always encouraged us for seminars workshops interactive sessions and everything that concerns our students i also welcome dr orun kumar nondi the iqac coordinator and he's also the head of the department of economics chakda college and our chief guest is not here still i would soon welcome her when she is here with us for now i would request our principal madam to make her welcome speech and inaugurate the lecture series Namaskar Shubho Aparna The Department of English Chakdaho College in association in association with Internal Quality Assurance Sale Chakda College have arranged this uh, web lecture series on 15th 18th and 28th of September for the benefit of our students today is the first day of this web lecture series this program is student centric and syllabus oriented but uh, i should i must i have to mention this that uh, this is not because the pandemic is going on i am thankful to the department of english that uh, it has been their practice to arrange such type of extension lecture through the year round the year for few uh, previous for the previous years also they have arranged such type of student centric uh, lectures lecture series the only difference is um, the mode of interaction has been changed from face to face learning face to face interaction to picture to picture interaction um, i would like to welcome today uh, we have with us shrimuti shormila mojumdar associate professor department of english university of kollani and uh, Dr. Vipro Narayan Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor, Government General Degree College, Kharagpur. Welcome, Madam. Welcome, Sir. I know. I hope that our distinguished professors, their lectures, will enrich our students and hope for the best. Hope for the success of this lecture series. thank you all of you whose constant effort we make this program a great success a grand success thank you namaskar thank you principal madam once again it has been her words of encouragement for our department like always i would now request dr orun kumar nondi sir to deliver his welcome speech please sir Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all on behalf of Internal Quality Assurance Sales Chakdao College. The Department of English of our college is going to organize CBCS curriculum-based web lecture series. I 
अरुण कुमार नंदी आईजीसी कोऑर्डिनेटर एंड एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स चकदाव कॉलेज आई एम वेरी ऑनर टू बी टू बी हियर अमंगस्ट यू ऑल इन दिस वर्चुअल इनोग्रल सेशन द ऑयल लेक्चर्स बाय द एमिनेंट एंड एक्सपीरियंस टीचर्स आर वेरी रिलेवेंट इन द करंट ग्लोबल सिचुएशन हु वुड हैव थॉट ए फ्यू मंथ्स अगो हाउ मच आवर डेली लाइव्स वुड बी चेंजिंग स्पेशली द चेंजिंग इन द टीचिंग लर्निंग प्रोसेस now we have an opportunity to create a new normal of the way it should be giving us the chance to reimagine in the future please join and participate actively and watch this these insightful and interactive online lectures and learn some new ideas new knowledge on the curriculum and also learn how to learn that is the pedagogy of your subject i'm sure that students will learn and enjoy very much from all these web lectures based on the present cbcs curriculum i wish the success of this program of web lecture series and wish everyone well thank you all especially we are very grateful to the respected sir and madam who have kindly agreed to deliver the lectures and they will enlighten the subject matter not only to the students students of chakdao college but also to the students of outside chakda college through a live streaming of the program on youtube i am also thankful to our honorable principal madam dr sagota das mohanto for her constant support and encouragement for conducting different programs like this web lecture series and webinar web talk faculty development program career counseling program cultural program in addition to the online regular classes my sincere thanks to madhumita das madam head department of english and also convener of the academic sub committee of our college and thanks to all the faculty members and students of the department for organizing this valuable program of web lecture series thanks to all teaching and non teaching staff of our college especially those who are providing web communication services smoothly thank you all for your time today over to jakia kalam thank you sir our sir has always guided us to new techniques innovative techniques of teaching and learning it was again the same in his speech he encouraged us and guided us for learning the pedagogy of this new mode of communication the online mode of communication uh we will soon begin our lecture our first session as soon as our guest arrives madam shurmila mojumdar till then i would request all of you to please keep your audio and your video on mute as soon as ma'am comes we will begin the lesson we will begin the lecture i would introduce her then until then please maintain a little decorum of keeping your audio and video mute thank you and um since our guest speaker is not here yet and since i missed out on something very pivotal i request my head our very own modumita das ma'am to uh, to inaugurate this web lecture series that has been her idea ma'am please speak over uh thank you professor jakia kalam a very good afternoon to honorable principal madam of chakda college Dr. Shagata Dashmohan Tha, and also the patron in chief of this entire web lecture series, IQVC coordinator and head of the Department of Economics, Dr. Orun Kumar Nondi, our eminent speakers of the two sessions today. First of all, Associate Professor Shurmila Mojumdar, Madam, from the University of Kollani, and then Dr. Bipro Narayan Bhattacharya. the resource person of today's second slot my dear colleagues from across the colleges and schools our office staff they are also our colleagues and finally my dear students from all the colleges this web lecture series organized by the department of english chakda college 
is in fact a matured brainchild of two months or so. The unprecedented pandemic was initially a global menace which landed all of us in a kind of uncertainty, instability, and discomposure, all of which have not come to a halt still and on surely perhaps in some years to come. In a country like ours, challenges are many, but we can't stop till the goal is reached. In this new normal situation, digital platforms have become a day-to-day -day essentiality, despite the gruesome fact that many of our students can't access internet for various reasons. Still, having the matter-of-fact concern about the students' interest and their future, the department, like many other institutions around, has arranged this curriculum-based web lecture series by the grace of the distinguished resource persons. I do believe that the sessions will benefit the students and evoke in them a spirit of enthusiasm and inquisitiveness. Thank you all once again. Over to Professor Zakia Kalam. Thank you, MD ma'am. And we have our chief guest here. Ma'am, I heartily welcome you to our first session. Ma'am is currently the Associate Professor in the Department of English, University of Kolani. If Obishek Da was doing it here, he would have welcomed you as our very own SM Madam. Ma'am, accept my gratitude too. Uh, many of us here, at least amongst the audience, might have been her direct students. And for them, this could be a detour down the memory lane. Ma'am has taught at the University of Kalyani for more than 30 years. She has two books and many publications to her credit. She has delivered paper presentations at international seminars. She has attended invited lectures at various institutes and colleges. She has chaired sessions of webinars, sorry, seminars, I should say, and workshops at her own university and other colleges too. There could be so much more that could be said about ma'am, but I would rather not ruin the ambience with the formal introduction. So ma'am, the stage is yours, the virtual stage is yours. I conclude here by thanking you for responding to our appeal. Shurmila ma'am, please if you could take over the virtual mic and the session is yours. The title of her presentation is Demands of Fiction, Virginia Woolf. Thank you. And please remember all of you to keep your audio and video on mute while ma'am speaks. That will help for a smooth functioning. There will also be an interactive session after her lecture for 15 minutes. We will introduce the participants then. Thank you. Ma'am, please take over. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I tried to log in through my laptop, which I couldn't. So finally, I came back to my mobile phone, with which I'm not very comfortable. But uh, since I couldn't log in through my laptop, uh, I have to make do with my uh, mobile phone. First of all, I thank the authority and uh, the English Department of Chagda College for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you and uh, I'm very grateful and secondly uh, my speech today will primarily be directed at the students so I will be talking about a few things which are very basic and not really demanded in a, a scholarly congregation but presumably this is a curriculum based lecture. That is why my primary uh, target will be the students. Uh, there are two texts of Virginia Woolf which are uh, prescribed in the syllabus. The one is the mark on the wall and the other is uh, modern fiction. like to say a few things
I think there has been some kind of a technical glitch again. We will wait for ma'am to rejoin. Actually, the problem is if I speak on the phone and the phone comes, uh, the connection automatically gets connected. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please I would have. Much, uh, I would have much liked to uh, log in through my uh, laptop. So, uh, uh, the first question that I will like to ask: Why did Virginia Woolf write these two pieces? when she did the first piece that is the mark on the wall was written in 1917 and the second piece was that is modern fiction was written in 1925 so there is a gap of about 8 years between these two writings now why did she write these things the fact is that was her way of negotiating with the task that she has taken up on herself which is writing novels so she was trying to uh, trying to argue presumably with herself why is it that she does not find the novels which were written immediately preceding uh, her age that is the late 19th and early 20th century why didn't she like it what does she like about her contemporary fiction and how does she justify her preference for contemporary fiction contemporary english fiction to a uh, fiction uh, novel that was written in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century now since mark on the wall was written earlier i will concentrate on the mark on the wall and how is mark on the wall categorized in your text in many cases on in most syllabus uh, syllabi i have found that this is uh, categorized as a short story i don't know why but it is a uh, writing of indefinite nature if i may say so only there is a uh, two three lines of dialogue at the end of the piece otherwise it is a concentrates on her own thoughts and what did inspire the thoughts it's a mark on the wall and that is just accidental it could have been anything else and this mark on the wall she is trying to uh, imagine why what kind of what is the mark of what is this mark of is it a nail or anything else but that is as i say it was accidental she was trying to understand how fiction is written and why does a particular author write a fiction that he or she does so if you read the piece carefully the mark on the wall you will you will find that she is trying to Uh, explore the various possibilities of the mark on the wall if it were a mark of nail why was it uh, what was it used for probably it was used for hanging a picture and then she talks about the former occupants of the, that particular house where she is in now and what kind of picture they would have hung if they at all did uh, hang a picture from there she moves on to various speculations i would rather call it speculations speculations at the end of which she comes to the conclusion that is that it's not a mark on the wall it's only a snail what does it mean it means that the occasion is accidental that occasion is of less importance than what is actually comes out of the occasion which could have triggered the imagination of the author now what is she trying to do here i will have to go back um three uh, three and half decades because in uh, 1890 um william james published a book uh, on psychology um in which she he has talked about that 
random random within quotes random behavior of uh, human mind he is talking about how human mind uh, moves uh, randomly wantonly without any kind of rationalization jumps from one thought to another goes back to something else may move forward to something um, even far distant from what the mind was thinking a few seconds before so this is something there are there were so many other things about it because this is prim primarily a book about principles of philosophy but this very idea that human mind moves erratically irrationally wantonly randomly gave idea to a kind of fiction writing which was enthusiastically taken up by the modernist writers i think the first person to do it with uh, any kind of success or for that matter major success was uh, james's own brother uh, henry james the novel was probably published in 1881 it was called the portrait of a lady in which there is a chapter if i remember correctly it is the 42nd chapter where uh, isabella the uh, protagonist of the novel she is in a very difficult point in her life she had to take a decision which uh, which will probably change her entire existence the way she looked at life and hence for the way she will look at life so she sits beside the uh, fireplace and thinks and this entire chapter is devoted to her train of thought and you see this train of thought is not necessarily consequential by which i mean that she thinks about something and let uh, a minute to let uh, later or maybe 5 minutes later maybe even 10 minutes later she thinks about something which is a direct uh, within quote natural uh, consequence of what she has been thinking before this is what i mean by consequential uh, progression of her thought she thinks randomly and this is called interior monologue which was heavily used by modernist fiction writers including ulf hersel who used this technique which is called the stream of consciousness technique as the the name is kind of self explanatory because the uh, name will tell you how the author negotiates with the thought of a particular character in a novel and virginia woolf has demonstrated clearly in the mark on the wall that she believes that the thought of a, a particular character or for that matter any character does not think very rationally that there is what she uh, she has rather sarcastically called the whitaker's almanac well just a second i will have to uh, read out from here um where she says that um the point of view which establishes whitaker's table of precedency which has become i suppose since the war have a phantom to many men and women so whitaker's table of precedency is a, a kind of almanac for um who comes to the coronation first who follows and then followed by somebody else so it is a rigorous uh, structured um sequence of events which means it is kind of predictive that people know who comes first who comes second who comes third and uh, who are the other people who will be following and her argument he i as i said she referred to it this whitaker's table of precedency as uh, as a sarcastic rem uh, remark because she did not believe that in fiction this is possible that you should not expect that there should be a structured thing a, a well developed plot uh, well defined characters who think rationally 
who speak logically, who follow their um, rational mind only, and the irrational mind is completely suppressed in the fiction. And here, uh, in the same paragraph, she talks about the uh, intoxicating sense of illegitimate freedom. Uh, and as a writer adds, if freedom exists. So what does she mean by this intoxicating sense of illegitimate freedom? Why this freedom is illegitimate? Because this is something which has not been practiced by authors in the previous decade, in the previous generation. And because the authors did not practice it, the uh, literary critics did not talk about it and did never thought that this was another way of creating fiction and more importantly the readers, the common readers were not accustomed to anything like this and so they did not expect anything which will celebrate this intoxicating sense of illegitimate freedom. So the argument here is fiction has so far been structured, rational, sequential and there is an expectation on, the beha on behalf of the readers. The authors fulfilled those expectations and the literary critics only talked about how the authors fulfilled those expectations. These are the same things that she will be talking about in modern fiction eight years, which she wrote eight years later. And this is intoxicating because this opens up new areas, new vistas, new possibilities. So this possibility is something which was missing in um, English fiction and which she was looking forward to. And in 1917, she was not yet very sure what she was trying to talk about. But she was trying to talk about a kind of fiction which will be inspired by something as inconsequential as a mark on the wall, something which is of very little importance, whether it's a mark on the wall, whether it's a snail on the wall, um, it really doesn't matter. And the kind of chain of thoughts which will be triggered by this mark on the wall can go in various directions, can be diverse, can be contradictory, can be uh, uh, inclusive, can be exclusive. So all kinds of possibilities are there. This is something that she tried to talk about when she wrote this particular essay. Uh, I would rather like to call it an essay. Essay mark on the wall. And uh, um, I would also like to uh, read out from this essay a few lines uh, where she talks about um, how if she were writing fiction or for that matter any author who should, who would write fiction of any consequence but because that is something she will be harping on again and again and again in modern fiction that writing fiction is not enough it, what is important what is enough what is good what is demanded what is the demand of the fiction is to write fiction which is of importance consequence and what constitutes this importance or consequence, how well and how deeply it uh, explores the uh, human soul. She is not talking about human mind. She is talking about human heart and human soul. So the depth of human existence, which she calls life, uh, should be explored in a work of fiction. So, uh, so she says, Um, it is full of peaceful thoughts, happy thoughts, this tree. I should like to take each one separately, but something is getting in the way. Where was I? What has it all been about? A tree? 
a river, the downs, Whitaker's Almanac, the fields of Asphodel. I can't remember a thing. So these are some of the things she has talked about in these essays. But towards the end of these essays, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what it was. It was. She doesn't remember a thing. Everything is moving, falling, slipping, vanishing. There is a vast upheaval of matter. Someone is standing over me and saying, I'm going out to buy a newspaper. Yes. Though it's no good buying newspapers, nothing ever happens. So this is the important thing that nothing ever happens. And things that are happening continuously, the trivial things which are not considered to be important enough to be considered in a fiction, these are the things that are very important and probably the only important thing in uh, fiction. From here, we move on to uh, modern fiction. I already told you that it was written eight years later. And by this time, momentous things have happened to English literature. We have to remember 1922 falls almost halfway between and some major modernist writings came out uh, in that year. And Wolf herself has produced um, uh, work of considerable literary value during this period. Now, when I come to modern fiction, there are a few uh, observations that I will like to make beforehand. The one being that she did not mention it, the stream of consciousness, but what she was trying to formulate in modern fiction is actually the idea and technique of stream of consciousness and was trying to justify how it is far better than the kind of um, fictional technique adopted by uh, her senior contemporaries or authors in the previous generation. That's one thing. Secondly, she has valorized Russian fiction and uh, in her opinion, Russian fiction is far superior to British fiction because Russian fiction is primarily spiritual and in most of the major Russian fictions, there are saintly figures and who are these saints? These saints are people who could establish enormous empathy with ordinary people and she herself has said that they do not address the mind, they address the heart. And I would like to point out that there are a few things in this particular essay with which I personally don't agree. Uh, I leave it open for the students to decide whether uh, they will accept my argument or not, but I feel when I'm teaching, I also need to tell the students that there are things that I don't agree uh, with. There are things that I argue in favor of. There are things that I, uh, that I want to advocate. That There are things that I don't want to advocate. So, something that uh, she has talked about in the modern fiction, uh, just a minute. Um, it's toward the end where she says that uh, it's not advisable that a novel should be categorized like novel should be categorized like this is comic or that is tragic, um, nor are we certain since short stories we have been taught should be brief and conclusive, whether this which is vague and inconclusive should be called a short story at all. Now she is talking about a short story by uh, Anton Chekhov. It's called Gusev. This observation about short story is something which I contest because short story is not about conclusiveness. 
the short stories can very well be inconclusive open ended and probably modern short story is more open ended than conclusive and there is a general observation about the my observation about the way she tries to foreground her thoughts though she herself has admitted that this is very this is something nebulous and this is very difficult to foreground in a language uh, which uh, uh, the language which has very definite uh, connotation because what she is talking about is actually nebulous and it's difficult to pin down it in a language with a diction which has definite and hence restrictive meaning so there is that problem of virginia woolf being rather um uh, what do i say rather again nebulous not to the point and they are by not making her point emphatically enough to establish her arguments why do i say this because uh, the essay modern fiction begins with her observation that uh, they are senior contemporaries who are writing uh it was the end of the uh, 19th and mostly early 20th century they are ag wells they are ag wells arnold arnold bennett and john goldsworth these are the three novelists that she particularly mentions she makes it abundantly clear that they are not similar they are very different in their way of approaching their subject matter and constructing their fiction but um, one thing she makes clear that they are inadequate in which respect are they inadequate she says that these people are materialists why they are the materialists they are materialists because they talks about life as it exists in its physical form material in the sense that it is related to matter so what does she mean by um, them being materialistic and them talking about uh, life in their fiction which are only physical now um she says that um uh, their fiction is confined only to a surface level of life of the characters who are involved who are portrayed in this novel and their reality consists in um when they are born where they are born whom they marry what do they do, do for earning whom they meet how many children they have that kind of thing she doesn't say it in so many words but that is what she means to say that their life is confined to the character lives of the characters uh, as portrayed by the authors are confined to their social level to their family level their institutional level these authors never delve deep into the heart and soul of the characters and that is why they miss the point of writing a novel so she makes a very radical observation here that the whole purpose of writing a novel is to capture life and if the novel does not capture life it is a waste of time waste of time on the part of the novelist waste of time on the part of the readers as well so uh, as i was telling you that she was aware that she was not being to the point and uh, so she says first she talks about um 
Arnold Bennett and uh, A.G. Wells and uh, John Goldsworthy and she says in their writings life escapes and perhaps I am quoting without life nothing else is worthwhile. It is a confession of vagueness to have to make use of such a figure as this. She is talking about herself and she knows that it is rather vague. So what does one mean by life? What does she mean by life in the first place? And uh, why does she believe that life means the same thing for uh, all the authors and all the readers? So she knows that it is rather vague. But we scarcely better uh, the matter by speaking as critics are prone to do of reality. So what she says that if we do not talk in this vague language and try to speak in the language of the critics, uh, we will not be any better off. And what is the long language of the critics? The critics talk of reality. Here comes a very difficult question which has been taken up by the subsequent critics and authors of modernist fiction. What does reality consist in? Is reality this mobile phone through which I am talking to you? Is reality the book that I am holding in my hand? Is reality the devices um, through which you are connected? These are uh, basically physical realities. And physical reality is important. But beyond this physical reality, there is another, there is something else which would also, or rather which should also be described as reality. For example, if you are sad, is that real enough like your mobile phone? I think it is. If there are people who are maniac depressives, people who contemplate suicide, it is their psychological, psychiatric problem, but it is as real as uh, our lunch. So there is another kind of reality. And the primary argument of Virginia Woolf in this essay is that most authors, most critics and most readers do not take the other kind of reality into account and do not think that these are good materials for writing fiction and in her argument these are the only materials fit to be included in fiction. And so she continues her argument. Um, she says that uh, there is a structured um, structured entity of a novel. The writer, I am quoting, seems constrained not by his own free will but by some powerful and unscrupulous tyrant who has him in thrall. So you see, he, she is talking about lack of free will. Do you remember what she was talking about in the earlier essay? That uh, illegitimate freedom. So why did she call this freedom illegitimate? Because it has not been sanctioned by literary canon. So her fight is primarily against a literary canon. A literary canon which has been um, established by the authors, by the critics as well as by the readers which imposes restrictions on the author so that the author, that the novelist is forced to provide a plot. There has to be a plot. Without a plot, there cannot be a novel. And uh, just a second. If you, uh, if you, uh, Remember your Aristotle, what is a plot? 
a sequential and logical development of uh, events and ideas so the moment the author is forced to provide a plot he is also expected to provide a logical rational sequential development of incidents in, the, in that plot and there should be a conclusion the conclusion has to be either a comedy or a tragedy so she says that the author has to provide a plot to provide comedy tragedy love interest and an air of probability embalming the whole so impeccable that if all his figures were to come to life they would find themselves dressed down etc so the very idea that novel has to have a plot a plot in the conventional sense is a rational development logical development consequential development of incidents which reaches a conclusion almost uh, a, a kind of conclusion which is as she says which has an air of probability so you know that it's a comedy uh, it's a tragedy it's a love story uh, something like that so what it is all about this is the question and you see our a common response to any work of fiction whether it's in the print media whether it's in the celluloid media whether it is on the electronic media our first question is what it is about isn't it have you seen that movie yes what it is all about have you read the book yes what it is all about so she says this very question of what it is all about is redundant in case of um, fiction it should be so that is the kind of fiction she is advocating not the kind of fiction to which uh, all these things are appended almost automatically that a plot and uh, uh, and a conclusion which is either tragic or comic or a plot which talks about love interest or things like this and she takes up this this uh, phrase like this and uh, further develops her argument she says look within and life it seems is very far from being like this so like this is something that has already been structured and predicted and she says life is uh, very different from this far deeper more complex and demands uh, a very sensitive uh, exploration which you do not find in the fiction of these materialist authors then in the in the essay she is she has already said that she is rather vague and she is trying to um, dispel the consequences that her vagueness may have on the reader because if it is vague probably the readers will not register her argument so she continues life is not a series of big lamps symmetrically arranged so if big lamps are symmetrically arranged that means there is logic and sequence in it and her argument is she is using metaphors obviously because uh, without metaphors it's very difficult to uh, foreground her argument her kind of rather nebulous argument uh, life is a luminous halo a semi transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the in so what is life it is like a luminous halo you cannot define it you cannot really hold it in your two hands probably uh, in a way you cannot touch it either and it has been there it is there and it will be there 
till our last breath it is something it is all encompassing overwhelming um, all pervading it is there so how do you uh, how do you represent this life in fiction obviously through uh, uh, through a technique very similar to the um, stream of consciousness technique which will uh, represent uh, how one feels how one thinks how one moves this thinking is not uh, cerebral engagement intellectual activity this thinking is also feeling this thinking is also emoting so this is the only way life can actually be represented in fiction and as she has been arguing all along that is the fiction there's the only demand of fiction that the authors need to meet and that is the only thing that that the readers also learn to demand of the authors and of fiction uh, so she says we are suggesting that the proper stuff of fiction is a little other than custom would have us believe it that uh, a person is born um, or um, uh, born into a uh, rich family gets married to a beautiful woman or a person or, uh, as the customer whoever it is please mute your audio priti shaha please mute your audio can please you carry on Uh, Ma'am, you have muted your audio. Yes, somebody has muted her audio. Um, it's showing. Ma'am, could you please unmute your audio? Hmm. Yes. Now, Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm rather technologically challenged, so it's fine, ma'am. Most of us are. i was talking about at virginia will say that we are suggesting i am quoting that the proper stuff of fiction is a little other than custom would have us believe it what does custom require us to believe that the materiality the materiality of existence and she says no the materiality of existence is not the thing fit for fiction and uh, in the next page she starts talking about uh, james joyce the portrait of a young man has already been published and when she was writing this uh, uh, essay probably or thinking about it um, ulysses um, ulysses was serialized um in um 1919 probably it was written and then it was uh, serialized in little review so she starts talking about um, uh, james joyce and she calls joyce a spiritualist as opposed to the earlier novelists whom they call materialists now why does she uh, call james joyce a spiritualist or james joyce a spiritual novel i am quoting uh, mr joyce is spiritual he is concerned at all costs to reveal the flickering of that enormous flame which flashes its message through the brain and in order to preserve it he disregards with complete courage whatever seems to him adventitious etc so she says that james joyce has actually started a school of novel writing if i may call it a school uh, 
a school of novel writing where the materiality of human life is completely disregarded and uh, Wolf believed more than 100 years ago um, or about 100 years ago uh, that it was it required enormous courage on the part of Joyce to completely flout the customary, the normative fiction novel and write about something and write in a mode which is uh, diametrically opposite to what the earlier novelists were doing and not only which is diametrically opposite, which actually opens up an enormous possibility for modernist fiction in English. So in a way, Joyce was epoch making, in a way Joyce was ushering in a new era in uh, English fiction writing and that is something which Virginia would hail and celebrate it. Now, if I may uh, slightly deviate from the text itself and try to connect a few dots, we will see that uh, William James wrote Principles of uh, Psychology. About 10 years back, his own brother wrote a novel in which he devoted an entire uh, chapter to the internal monologue of the central character, thereby paving, um, paving the way for uh, stream of consciousness writing. And it was in 1931, Virginia Woolf herself published a rather complicated stream of consciousness novel, which is called The Waves. So you see, uh, there, is a, there is a connection between what uh, philosophers were doing, what practitioners of fiction were doing, and in fiction, I include uh, both the uh, novelists and the short story writers because in this essay, uh, modern fiction, Virginia Woolf has cited a short story by uh, Shekhar which is called Gusev and uh, she admires Shekhar for the very fact that the, uh, the short story is inconclusive the, this particular story is open-ended, she probably did not realize that uh, the practitioners of short story, much before she started writing about these open-ended, inconclusive uh, novels, Shekhar was actually writing kind of short stories in the 19th century. So in a way, short story, which was uh, being written not very um, successfully uh, in England, but in the continent, particularly a man, uh, particularly by Shekhar or by Mopasa, I'm just uh, citing two names, there are scores of them who were writing short stories much before this stream of consciousness novels came into being. They were writing short stories which are uh, which tried to capture the innermost being of the um, individual, which did not necessarily talk about the materiality of human existence, stories which were inconclusive, stories which remained open ended, stories which probably encouraged the fiction writers of the early 20th century. That the, uh, by fiction writer, I mean the novel writers of the early 20th century. Because you see, when uh, Shekhar was writing his stories, uh, English novelists were writing the kind of novel which um, we call materialist. Now, she knows that between these two extremes that um, A.G. Wells, Arnold Bennett, John Goldsworthy, and uh, she has cited only James Joyce, to which you can add um, Virginia Woolf herself, you can add uh, Conrad. There is a middle ground 
and who stands on this middle ground is uh, the man is thomas hardy and wolf very astutely understands how uh, hardy is treading a middle ground hardy is not writing the kind of fiction that the trio um, has written but hardy is not uh like the modernist novel writers who succeeded him but he was a very good negotiation between the materialists and the spiritualists virginia woolf particularly cites mayor of casterbridge and uh, her her assessment of mayor of casterbridge is that that this is uh, this is a novel which kind of inspires the idea that novel can write about uh, feelings and emotions of people of uh, fictional characters and place more importance on it than on anything else like a uh, plot that does not necessarily mean that mayor of casterbridge doesn't have a plot mayor of casterbridge does have a very um, uh, very should i say um, well made plot so where is the point of negotiation there is a well made plot like the materialist novelists but there is also a peep into the inside of human heart uh, which subsequently became the playground of the spiritual uh, novelists and uh, uh, she says uh, she is talking about uh, ulysses and she says that um, ulysses suggests how much of life can be included and uh if you read ulysses and if you remember your um your reading of um old wives tale for example you will automatically realize that how much of life is excluded or ignored in old wives tale and how much of it is included in um ulysses so uh how does one do this now she has already talked about uh, what it is going to be like what it is all about what is the content of the novel now she tries to uh, spare a few thoughts about how to make it what to write and how to write she said that there has been a consensus among the critics authors and readers that there are a few requirements of a uh, method method of writing a fiction she has already talked about it plot etc etc now she says that there is nothing called a method any method is good or any method is bad for the matter uh, the only deciding factor is whether the method is successful in conveying what it wanted to convey so uh, you see she was essentially justifying a stream of consciousness technique where there is no plot well developed plot uh, things do not happen in sequence the novel does not necessarily have a well made conclusion uh good things or bad things do not happen to the characters it is neither tragic nor comic uh does not necessarily have a love interest or is not necessarily uh the most important thing in the novel so if you are writing about something which has so far been ignored and excluded from novel you will have to find a method that will do justice to what you are trying to include in your writing and that 
uh, method can be this stream of consciousness technique. Finally, as she uh, comes to the end of this essay, uh, she talks about the Russian uh, novelist. Now, something that I tried to tell you at the beginning of this talk, that uh, what happened in this essay is that Wolf started from a position where she has already come to the conclusion. She was not exploring the possibilities, arguing in favor of something, arguing against something, and then coming to a conclusion. She has uh, started from the conclusion and went backward to establish her argument. So when she started talking about a different kind of fiction and cited uh, Shekhar's short story, Gusar, she was already working towards this conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion is Russian novelists are far better than the English novelists. And um, it's very difficult to talk about contemporary uh, British fiction without any mention of the uh, Russian uh, influence. And, uh, and if, uh, if one is familiar with um, Russian fiction, that is read a couple of them, uh, the reader will think that reading this inconsequential British fiction is a <coughs> complete waste of time. And so, why are these Russian novelists better than the English novelists? She says that if we want understanding of the soul and heart, where else shall we find it of comparable profundity? So there is soul and heart in Russian fiction, which was sorely missing in the British fiction of the previous era. And she goes even further to say that in the Russian fictions, there are saintly figures. Why are they saintly? Because they have empathy for the suffering of others. They have love towards others. They endeavor to reach um, some rich people uh, with their heart and soul. So there is only spirit. And this spirit constitutes um, saintliness in Russian fiction. And, you know, there has been criticism uh, against Russian fiction novels that nothing happens in this fiction. You read for 20 pages, nothing happens. You read for 200 pages and nothing happens. What Virginia Woolf is trying to argue in favor of is that there is no, no necessity for anything to happen. Nothing may happen, but still it can be a very good novel. So, uh, she says that any deductions that we may draw from the comparison of two fictions so immeasurably far apart that we have to uh, kind of uh, convince ourselves that the Russian fiction has infinite possibilities of art and remind us that there is no limit to the horizon and that nothing, no method, no experiment, um, even the wildest kind of experiment uh, is not worthy of fiction. So, uh, if you read Joyce, for example, if you remember uh, Ulysses, you know that uh, reading Ulysses is not a very easy task. Uh, you have to change, completely change your mindset about reading novel if you have to read. Uh, Ulysses. So it's a very different kind of 
method and virginia woolf says all any method or and all methods are equally valid provided that there is no falsity and there is no pretense by which he means that fiction is modernist british fiction is on the social of a huge revolution there is nothing called proper stuff of fiction it can be anything there is nothing called proper method of fiction it can be anything the only thing that needs to be taken into consideration is the uh, purpose of writing novel is to explore life and life is not a series of symmetrical lap life is a hello a nebulous unfathomable life is consciousness that wraps up wraps us up from the beginning to the end of our lives life is uh, life is something which sometimes slips through uh, the fingers of our hand life is something which you cannot hold very tightly to but life is the only thing i repeat it's rather vague and it has to be defined by omission and commission what it is and what it is not this is the only thing that needs to be kept in mind and the art of fiction come alive when uh, when we try to break her bully her as well as honor her and laugh her how do we break and bully her we uh, we completely demolish the structure of materialist fiction we try to establish the tradition if i may call it a tradition uh, well at least the uh, possibility of creating spiritual fiction that is that is what is loving her and that is what is honoring her and only then fiction as an art form and fiction as uh, fiction as something that appeals to the imagination of the reader can renew itself and leave um, leave basically for how long nobody knows now before i conclude i would like to uh, tell you a few things about this art of fiction because till the end of the 19th century novels were being written and it started in the 18th century so more than towards the end of the 18th century so more than a period of 100 years novels were written and whatever was written was considered to be uh, to be novels and not much thought was spared for its uh, its art its poetics what is a novel and what is not a novel what is a good novel and what is a bad novel these things were or uh, what makes a novel so many questions what makes a novel uh and uh, how do you define the art of novel these questions started to be asked and explored at the beginning of the uh, 20th century only so in a, in the undergraduate um, classes probably em um, e. forster is prescribed aspects of fiction uh parsi labox book i have forgotten the name these are old books once upon a time these were canonical books these are prescribed so that the students have some idea what is a novel what makes a novel what the art of novel is all about but subsequently it has become much more complicated the first first man who has Uh, generously contributed to the complication of theory of novel is in my opinion henry james and then there have been a lot of them who has tried to establish some kind of a canon of novel writing but as you know there are many kinds of novel 
and so there are many canons of novel writing and there are more than one book which talks about this art of fiction so to conclude which two pieces which have been uh, prescribed in the syllabus are actually designed to give the students some idea about the demands of fiction about the way fiction has been written previously about the way modernist british fiction writers were envisaging their art about the way the older structure is demolished and a new structure uh, well no point denying the fact that even stream of consciousness also has a structure so a new structure was um, was being constructed it's actually an initiation into the path of journey of exploring various kinds of novels because you see if you go back to uh, richardson for example you have one kind of novel in the 18th century epistolary novel was um, considered to be um, uh, to be the norm of the day what's the advantage of this epistolary novel why do i go back to the 18th century because what i am trying to tell you is that this essay by uh, by virginia wool is actually one exploration one way of exploring the art of fiction and there has have been writers of fiction novelists who were no so acutely conscious of what probably what they were doing but they were still exploring this possibility is because epistolary novel where the major characters write letters to uh, one another and in those letters they talk about their uh, thoughts their feelings their emotions what is this delving deep into the heart and soul not by the method which modernist uh, novelists practiced live stream of consciousness even in the 18th century they tried to do something like this they wrote epistolary uh, novels where major characters were writing letters to each other in which they are supposedly pouring out their heart so there is a very basic rudimentary exploration of the idea of capturing life in novel and uh, throughout the 19th century almost throughout the 19th century we find novels uh, which are overwhelmingly preoccupied with social issues you uh, talk about dickens for example uh, probably the best known novelist of the 19th century of victorian england but there are other novelists who did not conform to this uh, to this mode for example um, for example um, emily bronte uh, wuthering heights wuthering heights is a novel of its kind but at the same time a novel which breaks down all the methods and structures practiced in the 19th century and probably a very modern novel if not modernist which uh, most of the modernist novelists would have gone back for inspiration so it is not necessarily the fiction in the 19th century where only materialist or fiction in the 20th century became wholly spiritual it's nothing like that virginia will for standing at a junction where she could perceive the limitations of the materialist novel or rather materialistic novel and she was foreseeing the future of spiritual novel which will bring in a uh, fresh life to the art of fiction because she felt the the genre of novel was getting stifled by this 
authors who paid too much attention to the um, uh, to the surface materialistic uh, details of life this is not to say that materialistic writing or rather materialistic considerations and spiritual considerations are mutually exclusive because human life is not um, is not something where it is either materialist or it is or it is spiritualist sometimes it is overwhelmingly materialist sometimes it is overwhelmingly spiritualist but there needs to be and there is it's not a question of necessity by virtue of being ontologically this is a requirement of life that there is a middle ground which is trodden by everybody from individual readers to uh, novelists to critics where it is sometimes materialistic sometimes spiritualistic so this is a writing which gives you a direction to the kind of fiction to the kind of novel that was being written in modernist england the inspirations the comparisons comparisons with uh, russians who are com considered to be far better comparisons with british materialistic novelists who are considered to be um, uh, not so good but at the same time this is something which gives you a direction a mile post uh, which you can use in your subsequent reading of fiction and theory of fiction thank you thank you so much ma'am uh the way ma'am yoked the two essays to the concept of stream of consciousness the illegitimate freedom or the very idea of the form and content of the modern fiction all the way the way she charted her way through the american counterparts henry james william james and tracing it back to the 18th century richardson or the 19th century hardy and emily bronte and back to the 20th century joyce i'm sure this is all going to serve as a perfect initiation into the studies of modernism for our students of semester 5 now ma'am there are some questions for you both are from our college uh, ma'am the first question is by biraj vishesh yeah is there any relationship between modernism and victorian culture how much modernist novel writing is influenced by victorian norms of novel writing ma'am if you could answer to his question yes if i have understood the question uh, correctly uh, you want to know whether there is a relation between victorian and modern fiction writing am i right uh, biraj you could speak for yourself yes ma'am exactly so uh, i don't know what we what you mean by connection there is definitely a continuity because uh, literature has a tradition which it breaks so because the majority of victorian fictions uh, and early 20th century fiction was materialistic that is how virginia woolf felt and thought and because she felt that it was stifling the art of fiction that is why she took up this cudgel on behalf of the modernist fiction that is the uh, connection okay and ma'am there is another question this is by otonu ghosh he is also from our college chart the college semester five he says uh, wolf says i prefer where truth is important to write fiction do you think fiction offers a different kind of truth than fact um yes what she uh, meant by truth i think is um that unfathomable part of life which can be felt uh which can be uh, in with which a person can establish empathy that is what she meant by truth and fact is 
something which also incorporates materiality. So, uh, your question is, please repeat. Sure, ma'am. His question is, do you think fiction offers a different kind of truth than fact? Yeah, different kinds of truths and facts. First, uh, there is a, a difference. I should not say difference. There is um, a distinction between what she understands by truth and what she understands by fact. Because in our everyday parlance, we sometimes use these two words in its, um, as interchangeable. And fiction offers different kind of truth different from what different from material experience because we hardly uh, think of uh, think of life per se as being deeper than what uh, meets our eye so the truth of fiction is different because in fiction the kind of fiction that she is particularly talking about in fiction that truth is the spirituality but that does not necessarily mean that factuality is completely excluded from it so it's a different kind of fact and it's a different kind of truth uh thank you ma'am there is another question uh, this is by Prabhu Pal, again, fifth semester, our college, Chagda College, and he's asking, what is the difference between Wolf's treatment of stream of consciousness and that of Joyce? Now, this is going to be a long answer, though. So, it's, it's very difficult to talk about it without examples. Uh, basically, stream of consciousness technique um, depends or rather incorporates the idea of discontinuity of thought, irrationality of thought, spontaneity of thought, and it, this is stream of consciousness. And when we are talking about a technique, that should be a method which can actually uh, reflect the way the mind moves, the way the mind uh, works. Now, first thing that I would like to point out is that no stream of consciousness technique is a match for the way a mind moves. Even if our, an author is writing a uh, novel using stream of consciousness, he or she also, I repeat, also edits his sentences, his sequences and his structure. So some amount of editing uh, do does creep in into any final text. The fact of writing it in the mind and committing it to paper, there is a gap. Even for the author who is very conscious, who is committed to the cause of writing stream of consciousness novel, even for him or her, there is a gap between what is committed in his mind and what he commits to writing. So, um, I don't know, have you read Ulysses or for that matter, um, portrait of the artist as a young man? Have you read? Uh, they yes, haven't yet started. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma we do have uh, a portrait of uh, the artist as a young man in our syllabus, in current syllabus. We do have that. You do have that. So, uh, what happens in that novel happens in one single day. Is it? Yes, ma'am. So, Bloom, the entire novel is about what uh, Bloom in particular, Leopold Bloom is his name, isn't it? Leopold Bloom. Um, things throughout the day. And what does he think about? Why is the novel called Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man? 
because joyce is also exploring the art of fiction there so he is using a technique where uh, all these characters they are trying to um, trying to bring out what is there in their mind so they are negotiating between what they commit in their mind and what joyce can actually commit to paper so that is his kind of uh, stream of consciousness technique uh, because uh, there are more than one character and all of them they primarily live in their minds and how do they spend one single day in their lives that has been foregrounded here but i repeat not exactly what they thought uh, during the entire 24 hours only those thoughts which pertain to their uh, their idea of art their um, Uh, their exploration of the um, artistic existence and thoughts pertaining to that uh virginia woolf's uh, you have read mrs dolway no ma'am not yet not virginia woolf has slightly different take on it and it's not essentially a difference in their technique because the technique is the same virginia woolf's take is different because she is a different writer because she is using it for a different purpose uh, mrs dalway i am citing this example mrs dalway is a novel about a character um, who actually it actually thinks about her life how she has been um how how she has been uh, deprived how she uh, has missed a lot of thing uh, things that are unfulfilled in her life so there the Uh, emphasis is on something different mrs dalway is in a way a feminist writing and portrait of the artist is a uh, 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 work about art itself art of fiction writing but in uh, mrs dalway virginia woolf was not exploring the art of fiction writing which she did in this novel and in the in this essay and in, in the mark on the wall in uh, mrs dalway she was trying to foreground how a woman feels things emotes uh, in a novel where the entire thing is centered on her and her thoughts her feelings her emotions occupy the center stage of course um, her thoughts sometimes irrational thoughts thoughts that go back and forth in time um, thoughts that are disconnected these things are there but the focus is not on the art of writing it focus is on the um, on how to use that art when writing a kind of feminist fiction uh thank you ma'am ma'am will you be thank able you, to ma take one more question yes, uh, thank you this is again by masood and his question is about her book how should one read a book he asks that what does she mean when she says there is always a demon in us who whispers i hate i love and we cannot silence him so what does she mean by this uh because human psyche is very um, complicated when she says that for example when she says that i um, i like spiritual kind of writing uh that is 
she at that point of time she may not be the same next day she probably was not the same um, uh, 10 years ago so all these things all these contradictory things are equally real in a human mind so the response accordingly will be very different contradictory conflicting but each of these responses are equally valid uh okay thank you ma'am i will request our head professor mudumita das ma'am to speak a few words md ma'am is she here okay ma'am needs to unmute herself i guess i can't yes, see her I, i i'm here only yes, she's here okay. yes yes actually ma'am uh, somehow i i am also technically challenged somehow i cannot use my chat box so i wanted to talk to you and thank you properly uh, we are very grateful to you ma'am for your exhaustive and meticulous deliberation and uh, myself has uh, listened to you from the beginning to end very minutely and very curiously hope the students uh, make the most of it we we'll look forward to another session some day in future also thank you so much madam on behalf of the department thank you, you again take so much attention and time to whatever i was talking about no no i, I listen to you madam properly i did not miss any word thank you welcome ma'am thank you you also and ma'am uh, i would rather like to repeat a comment from a student he says thank you madam it was such an insightful and thought provoking session and has provided us with a critical observation of wool this was prabhu pal uh, i think it has been enlightening for us teachers as well we tend to forget some little things but then your uh, entire deliberation was indeed a complete recapitulation for us as well i thank you so much ma'am for sparing your time and uh giving your time to us i should say uh, i would also like to thank our principal madam our patron chief dr orun kumar nondi who has been with us all this while thank you so much sir i thank all my students our college as well as those from upper sub i thank my colleagues from chanta college and other colleges as well i thank most dr onipan banerjee our technical advisor uh without him this wouldn't have been possible uh he is an assistant professor in zoology i thank mr oni proy the technical assistant of our college he helped us by sharing the post on facebook and i also thank mr bishwadeep for his technical advices thank you so much madam with this we are closing our session and i would remind you all for the second slot which is at 6:30 thank you ma'am students you may now leave and uh ma'am is probably left all right uh the session has come to a close now you may all uh, leave and come back at 6:30 thank you ma'am where is the feedback form there's no feedback form <laughs> छूने छोड़ता है अनेक